Hell Yes Life, Episode 17. Welcome to the Hell Yes Life Podcast, the show that helps you come alive so you can live a Hell Yes Life. I'm your host, Norman Bell. Hey everybody, Norman Bell here. Welcome to the Hell Yes Life Podcast, where you will hear inspiring stories and actionable tips from our amazing guests that will motivate you to move towards your Hell Yes Life. If this is your first time listening, hell yes, I'm glad you can join us. The Hell Yes Life podcast releases new episodes every Tuesday, and show notes can be found at hellyeslife.com. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite RSS feed, and please join the Hell Yes Life private Facebook group, which you can access from hellyeslife.com. Also, a special announcement. On April 4th, I'm releasing my interview with special guest John Lee Dumas from the blockbuster podcast Entrepreneur on Fire, which has over 1 million monthly listens. JLD stopped by to talk about his brand new offering, The Mastery Journal. Here's just a short clip from the interview. But what are you going to do? Wake up with a plan in place. That's your morning routine. So I wake up every single morning. I know that I'm walking right down to my gym. I'm crushing 2,000 meters on my rowing machine. I'm maxing out on pull-ups. I'm coming back up, shave, shower, and then I'm sitting down. I'm meditating for seven minutes. I'm journaling for 15 minutes. And then I'm moving into my first focus session of the day. That's my Mm -hmm. morning routine. I know that because I've written that down the night before and I know what I'm going to win because we also have the one focus for tomorrow as well. So I go to bed knowing that when I wake up, I have my day laid out for me. Not my entire day, just the beginning part of my day. And it allows me to have some agility as things crop up. I know things happen. I get it. I live in the real world. But winning tomorrow today by putting that morning routine down and executing upon that no matter what happens after your morning routine, you've already won. Well, hell yes, lifers. I look forward to sharing the entire episode with you on April 4th, so be sure and tune in. Now, let's get into today's episode. Today, my guest is Robert Galinsky. Robert is a public speaking coach, spoken word artist, playwright, activist, and as he describes himself, a town crier. Robert currently teaches teenagers at Rikers Island Jail through the Literacy for Incarcerated Teens program, that's LIT, and through GalinskyCoaching.com. He is the founder of the Galinsky Volunteer Vanguard. Now, Robert is also a head speaker coach for TEDx Teen and TEDx Ful- uh, Fulton Street, and he is a contributing editor for the new site, The Fresh Toast. He has been featured as a guest on such shows as The View, ABC Nightline News, Dr. Oz, The Today Show, Ricky Lake, and also The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and many more publications. Pretty impressive, Robert. Now, you can learn more about his work at galinskyplace.com, and I'll feature all these links in the show notes. I'm excited to share my conversation with Robert with you, so hell yes, let's get to it. Hey there, Robert. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Norman, how are you? I am doing just great. Now, Robert, are you ready to tell our listeners about your Hell Yes Life? Hell yes. Hell yes. Let's do this. All right. Well, Robert, I always like to ask people right off the bat um, to answer this question. What is your Hell Yes? That is, what do you think is your real passion, the thing that, that lights you up? The thing that lights me up is to spread truth to find truth in each individual that I come in contact with when I'm doing my work to let them express it and live it. That's the thing that, that makes me feel the most excited when people have personal breakthroughs, whether they stumble through them or they glide through them and I'm a part of it. That's my hell yes passion. Awesome. Spreading truth. I love it. Love it. So, um, tell us a little bit about you, Robert. What are, you've got a lot of things going on and we'll, we'll, um, hit those point by point, but just give us an overview. Sure. I live in New York City. I live in Manhattan in the East Village. I came here a whopping 28 years ago and fell in love with it. Uh, I was born in a, in Connecticut in Hartford, lived, grew, grew up in Wethersfield, Con- Connecticut, which is a really typical American suburb. And, um, 
left there around the age of 18 to go to college and realized when I left, I was quite sheltered in this suburban American dream landscape. Um, came to New York. I've always been involved with special education, even as a young kid, as a grammar school student. I would go into school early and work with the pre-K special ed department. We had a really progressive one in my school. Um, so all my life, I've really been interested in what people call people on the margins. Um, and now I've currently developed a, a life in New York City that includes being addicted to social media because I really love the idea of spreading messages. It's such an uh, efficient way to do that. And so here in New York, I involve myself in really a, many different projects, all related to live performance, theater, self-expression, creativity, working with populations that mostly are teenagers. I work with teenagers at Rikers Island Jail. I work with teenagers through TEDx Teen. So I'm dealing with kids that are on a wide spectrum of what people think is successful or normal. And um, yeah, I mean, that's my life. I, I'm really into social media messaging, uh, digging in, finding the truth where I go, putting that out through theater and spoken word and those kind of creative live event aspects. Awesome. I love, love to hear about all that stuff that you're up to. I'm looking at your, um, your website, Galinsky Coaching. So just to be clear, what, what is it that you're working on with, uh, with your students? So I do a few different things. When I am coaching speakers, whether it's adults or teens, it's really about presentations. You know, we're, Norman, we're living in a time now where it used to be that you'd have a PR department in your company or, or a PR department that would handle, um, all communications to the world. But now with the advent of the internet, social media, with even Ted talks, how they've revolutionized, um, who can speak and, and how people listen. I found that everybody that works in an organization or is starting a company needs to be that spokesperson for the company or the mission. So you've got people a lot of times with great ideas that aren't trained in how to talk to audiences are scared or nervous. Um, have amazing ideas, but aren't really skilled at articulating them. So my work is to help those people who are making presentations, pitches, TED Talks, speeches, um, learn how to identify their strengths that already exist, have confidence with that, be relaxed with that, and tell the world their story. Uh, when I go to Rikers Island Jail, I work with an organization called Literacy for Incarcerated Teens, and I use literacy uh, and language and writing and reading as a filter to talk about good decision making, about life vision, changing one's life, finding one's dream or identifying and trying to go for that. Um, so B the BBC radio did a story on something I was doing once. And they it's funny, they gave me a quote that I actually was pretty proud of. And was ha thankful that they gave it to me because it kind of clarified some of the things I do. They said, uh, Robert Galinsky teaches you how to open the portfolio of yourself. And that's that summed it up really, really well. Tell me what that means to you. That means, again, uh, going into double – I kind of consider it like double-clicking somebody, finding out what's inside them from their pain, their passion, their stories, their visions, and helping them – to identify those things, bring them closer to the surface of their lives so that they can go out and attack what they want to achieve, whether that means helping to make a plan for them or just identifying that, that idea, their passion, their hell yes. Um, and for me, a lot of times it's, I'll start off by saying, you know, I'm not going to, I may not tell you things you don't already know, but some of the things we already know need to have a yellow highlighter. Mm -hmm. put across them because we forget them and they get lost. And, and, uh, I, so I feel like I'm either putting a yellow highlighter on what already exists that people have overlooked, or I am bringing some new ideas to people that they can work with. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a little bit of this. I mean, you're much further uh, along the path than I am, but as far as uh, I've done some storytelling workshops and I found it so interesting, you know, when people start really delving into, 
uh, their past to find their kind of their core stories, the, the, the ones that they really connect with as part of like, you know, who they are. Uh, it can, can give them such kind of meaning and clarity about where to go next. Uh, what, what kinds of things do you do when you're working with these students to help them tell their story? A lot of times it's, um, improvisational theater games that I work with. Um, sometimes it feels a little bit like it can get into therapy kind of, uh, but I try to, to shy away from that kind of a thing. Um, you know, word games, um, I try to, when I go to the, the jails, I try to meet the people where they're at, which is a very common phrase in, in what, what kind of work I'm doing is I'll get a gauge of, you know, where they are, what they're trying to, accomplish and say, all right, well, let's, let's look at some clear ways for you to get that done. Um, you know, and when I'm working like as an example, TEDx team, there was a really amazing young lady who was one of the only, you know, young females to climb Mount Everest and she climbs mountains. That's what she does. She's a, she's probably about four foot 11, you know, 98 pounds, but she can climb any mountain better than the biggest, burliest mountain climber there is. Awesome. She had to make a speech at TEDx Teen, and she was petrified. And uh, and mm. and everybody was looking around at each other. Like, you climb mountains and you're not mm. scared, but you get on the stage. So one of the one of the real specific things I tell people is, you know, you have been chosen to do this for a reason. You've been chosen to be here for a reason. You got to remember that. That's a confidence builder right there. People believed in you to come here and tell your story. So. Get rid of some of the stress now. It's not like you're here by chance or accident. It's not a freak. It's somebody thought that they, your story needed to be told. Another thing is to talk to somebody like that and say, you know, when you um, do, you know what you're doing when you're climbing a mountain. Yes. Do you know how to explain what you're doing climbing a mountain? Yes. Great. You know the material, right? Yeah, I know the material. You know the. It's just like repeating. You know your material, don't you? This is your life. Yes, I do. Great. Then go out there and just tell us what you know. That's great, yeah. you, you know. And so it's really it comes down to Norman a lot of confidence building. And again, that's why I say a lot of that's already there. They're, they look at me they're like, you know what? You're right. I I know a lot about mountain climbing. All I have to do is share it. You know, I don't have to do anything to impress anybody other than share what I know. What is what can you say about that? I think I saw a video where you were talking to, and we can talk a little bit more about this. That your your coaching of uh, people who are interested in being on reality TV shows, but sure. I think you were you were telling them um, about hey, you know, you just need to uh, present your authentic self. Now, this is something whether you're you're in a presentation or not. It's sort of a question of like, well, what does that mean, my authentic self? Um, right. Yeah. And authentic, authentic is a word that kind of gets used a lot now and it's almost becoming inauthentic because it's so <laughs> overused. <laughs> right. Um, but again, it's going back to, I think, kind of like what Hell Yes does is where your, your best podcasts are, are usually when people are telling their specific interest, their, their stories, their, the stories they've lived. So what I do with people who want to be on reality television, there's a couple of things. One, it's like being an actor, but not acting. You know, actors, when they get the script, they go, okay, this is a person who has X, Y, Z variables they're dealing with. And then they look inward and say, how have I ever dealt with X, Y, and Z? And then they explore themselves. They explore their emotions. They explore their, their body, their instrument. Um, they use experiences from the past, real life experiences they've had to color what the character is supposed to be. It's the exact same thing for reality television, except we're eliminating that last step. You're not putting a script over it. You're doing all the same research, the internal examination. Who am I? What do I want to tell the world? What am I? This is my opportunity to say something to the world. So what do I want to tell them? So we do real specific inventory of stories from joyful to tragic. We talk about personal issues that they have, bring those to the surface and then say, okay, now you're going to be thrown into a situation where they're going to put stress on you, whether it's a competition or a fly in the wall kind of show, but you're going to be the person in the room among many other techniques that we, we talk about. But you're going to be the person in the room who is really clear about who you are and identified. And you also have accessed a bunch of stories, almost like you would do for a media interview where you prepare so that they're ready to go. They're, they're all loaded and ready to go and they're real. Yeah. And when the, when the stress hits you, when the situation or scene they throw at you hits you, now the arsenal of who you really are is at the ready to come out. Right, right. And it's not that they're, 
putting together this fake sort of thing, ar- artifice about who they are, but it's just getting clear about here are the stories that, uh, there are really, uh, you know, kind of exemplify who I am. And when I tell those stories, I really light up and, and become myself. Exactly. And, right. you know, people have a, now have earned their PhDs in watching reality television. So, when, you know, so <laughs> they, one, the viewer can spot fakes very quick. They can spot liars very quick. And you have to be an, an incredibly good liar to survive on these shows because just like in life, you got to keep track of your lies. If you're lying and people are going to catch you and that's where you're going to fumble. And in reality TV, they're watching, you know, every move you make. So to maintain a lie isn't going to work. And so we suggest to people, don't lie, tell the truth. And that's what the viewer wants. They want true passion. So when there is a car crash on reality TV or a joyful moment on reality TV, it's backed up by the true person, the real person's feelings and emotions. Right. And that, uh, that sense that the audience gets that this is authentic, this is an authentic person, uh, is going to maybe help them stay on the island. That exactly. Longer, right? <laughs> exactly. They don't get voted off the island quick. They don't get kicked out of the house quick. Right. You know? And I have a lot of people who come to me saying, this is what I think I should be. Or I've watched so much reality TV. I want to be the type of person that's blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, the, the wise guy on the show. And I'm like, are you a wise guy in real life? Well, not really. Well, then I'm, I'm like, let's not, you know, train you to be something you're not. What are you in real life? Let's bring that to the show. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, to, to extract this out into the general, this is something that we can all think about is like, who, who are we really? You know, like when we, when we shed all the, uh, the artifice, you know, what's, what's left there. Right. Um, well, tell me a little bit more about this, um, this program that you've been involved with, uh, literacy for incarcerated teens. Literacy for incarcerated teens is a really small, wonderful nonprofit based in New York city. It's run by um, retired librarians who saw that in the judicial or in the in the prison industrial complex that teenagers um, were not being provided books enough books and maintaining um, the libraries in in the facilities. Uh, one of the number one causes of people going to jail and going back to jail over and over again is illiteracy. Because people who can't read or can't read well feel um, lesser than other people, and therefore they take steps that are a little bit more drastic um, to compensate. So they saw that that was a cause of recidivism. They also saw that nobody was really kind of keeping track of or even providing libraries for these kids. If a kid gets put in jail or prison they and they haven't graduated high school, by law they still need to be provided – access to education. That's not something that's not part of the punishment. So Literacy for Incarcerated Teens builds libraries, maintains libraries in these facilities. Um, Jamal Joseph is an amazing person. You probably should have him on your show someday. Um, he's a Black Panther. He's the chair of Columbia University's screenwriting program. Uh, he's an Oscar-nominated songwriter. He runs an incredible theater company called the Impact Repertory Theater in Harlem. He went to a boy's prison upstate to do a commencement speech at a high school graduation. And I was just, I saw the tweet and I was like, what? First of all, that blew me away. I was, I'm like 50 years old. I'm so naive. I don't even know there's, you know, people doing commencement speeches at graduations in prisons. And then secondly, I was like, mm. what kind of a person, what kind of history do you have to have to be able to one, to be the one that goes up there and gives them advice? Pretty exceptional. So I asked mm. him, he told me lit, um, asked him to go up there with his book and distribute his book. So one thing that another thing that Lit does is uh, they bring authors into the system and they give away their books and they talk about writing and they talk about their lives. I proposed a workshop for Lit that was um, about using literacy to create good decisions, character building, um, and to educate. Lit loved the idea of the workshop. We did a test and that was about four years ago. And so since then I've been – um, working with literacy for incarcerated teens in prisons throughout New York and jails, and then continuing to develop the program. That is great. That is great work. Um, tell me a little bit about, so, um, did this start on Rikers Island? Was that the, the first place that? No, actually Rikers Island, uh, is not an easy place to get into unless you get caught doing something. So, um, it took a while for us to get into Rikers Island. Uh, I went up to, uh, I did a six hour train ride up to 
uh, Tabor, New York, and went to a girls' reg- residential center there, up to Hudson, New York, out in Long Island. It's interesting that these facilities are all over the place. You just kind of don't notice them. They're kind of tucked away. So I've been in a number of different facilities around New York. Um, Rikers Island passed two years consistently. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the actual, the original question was. Sorry, Norman. <laughs> oh, just, uh, what was Rikers Island the, the, the first place that you did this? Actually, I just wanted to know a little bit more about your experience going in there. So yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, sure. It's, yeah. Um, Rikers Island, it's interesting. It's got the worst reputation in the world and it's well deserved. Um, however, I have to say that the majority of the people that work at Rikers Island have their hearts in the right places. There's some amazing, incredible people at Rikers Islands, Rikers Island on the staff from prison guards to correction officers to uh, people who are working as commissioners and deputy wardens. So it's a bleak and terrible environment uh, with quite a lot of good people in there trying to make it a better place. It's the, you know, the experience is, is surreal. You know, you walk in, you're, there's everything gets turned over. Your, your phone gets turned over. You don't get your, you don't have your phone. You don't, you have to lock everything up. You go through door after door after door that is slammed. You're escorted most of the time around. Um, and then depending on where I end up, you know, sometimes it's in a really nice room with, um, some facility, you know, some books and, and some computers. And then sometimes it's in uh, a room that it's, you know, one of the saddest rooms I've ever been into where, the gates are, it's, they're cages. They're not even barred. They're not even walls. They're cages. And you see these kids in these cages, um, twiddling their thumbs or playing with decks of cards. And, uh, it's rough. It's rough. And sometimes it's hard to go in. Um, I always remember I get to go out on the same day. So that's always a positive that, that gives me a little lift. Um, there's a, there's a noise here. I live in New York City. So you're getting a, Slight, you might be getting a slight noise in the background. Let's start our steam heat here in New York. Oh, you know, that's if you can hear it. I don't know. So I just, yeah, uh, just a little bit, but that's okay. okay. You know, we want to get a little bit of that, that real New York. Yeah, it's the tenement, the tenement experience here. There you go. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 you know, I get to leave. They don't. Um, there are, um, places like I said that are, winding hallways that lead to these little rooms that are just you're kind of like wow this is tucked way away is this person are these people forgotten about but they're not everybody who uh goes in gets attention sometimes bad sometimes good Mm. Mm. wow that is amazing so is there any um story that comes to mind out of whether it was at rikers island or not that, that some someone that you worked with in this program and, um, you know, either the relationship you, uh, uh, formed with them or an experience you had with them that, you know, you could see that this, this program really helped them. Yeah. The way I know that the program helps them is when I'm leaving, if they say, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Then mm-hmm. I know something, something good is happening. And that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and that is something I also learned is that people don't come back, you know, people, come in for a moment and then uh they never come back a lot of times when i do come back the kids will be like oh my god you came back i can't believe it nobody ever comes back so mm-hmm. to me that's an emblematic of also a problem in their in their lives at home of having parents that are not available to them or not around mentorship that's not reliable um and inconsistent relationships um so that is always a testament to I'm doing the right thing. Um, you know, I'm sitting across from about a, a month ago, I'm sitting across from somebody who's uh, 18 years old and he's actually committed a murder and I'm sitting there and I'm wrestling with my, you know, other things in my life. I'm wrestling with Trump in my mind. I'm like, how I'm not giving Trump a chance. I can't stand Trump. And then I'm thinking if I can sit across from an 18 year old who's committed murder and give him chance, a chance, then I've got to be able to give Trump a chance, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of hip, hypocritical for me to sit in front of somebody who's um, broken the law in such a way, but not to allow Trump a chance. Now I, I've clarified my thoughts with Trump. It's you know for me Trump has given himself a chance during the two years leading up to you know through his campaign, and for me personally he proved that he doesn't 
deserve a chance. Um, mm -hmm. you know, people are saying, Hey, he's in office now. Give him a chance. I'm like, he had his chance when he showed us for two years who he was. That was the moment. Those were the moments where he was proving to himself and every other candidate was proving to themselves and to us who they really are. And he proved to himself for me anyway, that he's not worthy of the office. Now I have hope and there is a chance that he, ca he can change. I think every human being has that possibility to change. Um, so I can't again, justify sitting amongst people who have actually committed crimes um, and offer them that opportunity and, and not offer him that opportunity. So that was really enlightening for me. Yeah, I'm going through my own little journey with this too. And, and, uh, hell yes, lifers, we're, we're at the, uh, the end of January. This might, uh, actually air, you know, maybe a month or so after yeah. this. But, um, you know, we're just in the, the opening weeks of the administration here. And, uh, it, you know, it's, 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 uh, let me put it this way. I'm having a hard time. I, I kind of had a bit of an open mind. And then, you know, since he's gotten going here in the past couple of weeks, I was like, oh, I think he blew his chance there, man. I don't yeah. know about all this stuff. So, so, but uh, that said, I, I, I want to have kind of a, a bit more of a spiritual perspective about this. And, right. and part of it is that, you know, as much as I don't agree with this person or I want to demonize this person, uh, he is a human being. He's not a demon, I don't think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and uh, so therefore, like Scrooge or the, you know, the Grinch yeah. or something like that, there's uh, still that chance that something might happen, however remote that might be. But anyway, uh, I, I we'll, think, you know, Norman, yeah. I think it's important for me anyways to not let my sliver of hope for this guy. Uh, get in the way of combating the obvious things that he's doing that I disagree with and that I think are wrong. So, and just, but you know, Absolutely. by, by saying there's a chance that there's something good out of this person that does not to me diminish my fervor to fight against what he's doing that I do believe is wrong. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, as far that that's a kind of a clarifying thing for me, like, OK, I'm going to remember that this is a human being yeah. and I'm going to go out in the streets and protest exactly. Exactly. all these things that I am uh, adamantly against. Um, well, let me let me uh, pivot back to you, uh, Robert. I wanted to ask um, now, you, you know, you're well into your hell yes life. you got all kinds of great things going on. Can you take us back to an early time in your life uh, when you faced a real challenge that you weren't sure what direction to go or whether you were going to be able to overcome it and what lessons you learned. Um, yeah, it's very personal, actually. When I was younger, I, I lived in a suburb in Connecticut and we had a very, um, typical kind of, uh, American life. Um, however, at a certain point, there was a disruption in my home where, uh, my father and I had this very terrible relationship and, I would look, I looked out my bedroom window one day and I said, wow, this is amazing. There's lawns, there's trees, there's driveways, there's doggies running in the yard and people really living this uh, American dream. Um, but inside my home right now, the disruption is such that this is hell for me. So it, it taught me that was a moment, a hell yes moment where I was like, you know what? Not everything is what it seems. You know, we have the same thing. We have a beautiful home. We have the lawn and. We have the deck in the back and the cars and um, the, the, the way that the United States of America has painted what everybody should try to reach out for. And at the same time, that's not what was going on inside the home. So it taught me that things are not the way they seem. Um, they, they do not match up. And that gave me the benefit of the doubt, Norman, to look out at every single person and say, wow, just because they look like they have the perfect life does not mean they do have the perfect life. So don't judge. Don't judge. Mm -hmm. It was a, yeah. super powerful for me. Uh, that's a good one. It reminds me of a, a um, saying that I've heard, which is don't compare your insides with other people's outsides, right? You know, like we, everybody's lives look so great uh, on the street or on Facebook, but, uh, you know, just assume that everybody's got something going on, right? Yeah, exactly. So now if we, if we pivot to looking towards the future – um, I always like to ask our guests, uh, what your, your big vision for the future is. And the term I like to use is your cringeworthy vision. So this doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your vision, but just that when you think about sharing it with other people, it makes you cringe because it's so big. What's your I, big vision? I, I love that question because it scares the lights out of me. And <laughs> I know that when I'm scared, good things happen, breakthroughs happen. So my cringeworthy vision for my hell yes life is 
I have a home in LA with a little in-ground pool and a great view and the doors are open 24 seven because the air is LA air and the temperature is always kind of cool and warm. I'm hosting a TV show. I've got a very successful podcast. I've got a small theater in Manhattan, which is my home base. So I'm bi-coastal. I can go to LA to relax and chill out. If I need to do some TV work, I come back to New York as home base. I've got my little theater that I'm running. I'm interviewing people the way you are on my podcast and sharing strength and knowledge. That's my hell yes, cringe worthy vision. Oh yeah. I love it. I love the specificity there too. You know, like the, uh, the LA house with the doors open. Yeah. 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 yeah I love I mean, it. You, you asked for the cringe worthy. So I was like, okay, that's it. There you go. Thanks for sharing that. That's sure. great. And, and hell yes, lifers, you know, when you're putting together your cringeworthy vision, get specific like Robert just did, you know, envision it in your mind, write it down and start really, um, you know, getting really clear about what that is. I read a vision for, uh, my, my cringeworthy vision every morning. And it's, uh, it, it's funny how it's, it's starting to manifest. Of course. So oh, that's great. Yeah. So before we go, Robert, um, can you give us one tip, quote, or resource that has helped you in your journey that you would like to share with our listeners? Can I share two two small ones with you? You certainly can. Okay. So one is there's a brilliant book called If You Want to Write, and it's written by a woman named Brenda Euland. Have you ever heard of this book? I haven't. It's an incredible book. It's called If You Want to Write, Brenda Euland, E-U-L-A-N-D. And it's not about writing per se. It's about living a creative life, owning your stories, your emotions, and honoring those things. So I suggest this book. It changed my life. A friend named Tom Jackson uh, recommended I get this book. He actually bought it for me. And I now buy it for people as a gift and I read it on and off all the time. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, I had an opportunity to be on The View once because of the reality school and I was petrified. And one of my friends said to me, Robert, now this is the chance to tell the world what it is you want to tell them. And that simple advice just cleared for me any stress because I was like, he's absolutely right. I don't have to do anything that, that I think they expect. What I need to do is tell people what I think the world, what I, I want the world to know that I've been given an amazing opportunity and platform and podium here. So, Go out there and tell the world what you want them to know. And Mm. it it liberated me from so much of my anxiety and my fear. Um, And I think that is why when I saw your show, Hell Yes, and I said, you know, I'd love to be on your show. It was because of, again, going back to that advice, which I got about nine years ago from my friend Leo Fernikis saying, well, Hell Yes has given me an opportunity to tell the world what I want to tell them. I'm going to I'm going to go for it. I'm going to see if I can get on this show. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad you contacted, uh, contacted me, Robert. And, uh, it's, it's been great having you on the show and, you know, I look forward to keeping in touch. So, um, to round things out, uh, tell us on the internet, what's the best place to find you? You can find me on Galinsky coaching and that's Galinsky with a Y Galinsky coaching.com and also Galinsky place.com P L A C E. Okay, great. And we will, of course, include those links in the show notes so you can get in touch with Robert. And um, so, Robert, to close things out, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. I'd love, I'd love to say hell yes together on the count of three if you're ready to do that. I'm psyched. Yes, oh, let's do all it. All right, let's do it. One, two, three. Hell, hell yes. yes. All right, Robert. Thanks so much for joining thanks, me. Thanks, Norman. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Hell Yes Life podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite RSS feed. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review. And if you want to stay connected, visit hellyeslife.com and sign up for the e-newsletter and private Facebook group. Again, I'm Norman Bell. Thanks for joining me. Now let's get out there and live a hell yes life.